The following program was produced by an independent community producer. The opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of the ECAT staff or board of directors. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. It's the Ron Van Dam Show. Hold on tight, things can get a bit weird, if you like that sort of thing. Hey, welcome to the show, it's the Ron Van Dam Show. I have to explain all the time what the show is about because I don't think you can necessarily retain a thought for an entire week. I know I can't. I do a uh, daily program. I used to do it on broadcast radio for 25 years and then the past oh, eight or nine I've been doing the national podcast thing as well as syndicated radio. I do the show every single freaking weekday. On the podcast alone, 2,400 episodes. That's crazy. And once a week, I come into this studio and I do the visual version of the show so that you can see that I do move my hands every once in a while in my life. Other than that, I sit in a chair and talk. It's what I do. Thanks for being here. I talk about things that most people don't talk about in a sense that uh, why would you bother talking about this stuff? You you talk about politics and your kids and where they're going to school and your car isn't working well and you got a pain in your elbow. I get it. We all make conversation like that. What's happening in the neighborhood? What's on TV? A movie you saw? The book club is next Thursday. All that stuff. But... uh, (laughs) You talk about your kids, enough with the kids. Uh, What I do is just talk about things that we don't usually talk about, that we all experience, and that makes us all just one person. And if you took all of us and made us one person, we'd be extremely fat. Okay. All right. Fine. Hey, did you hear the news? Look, I'm, I'm raising my hand. I'm moving. Did you hear the news? that apparently Aerosmith, which is uh, Boston's band, whatever, uh, they are, they have announced their final concert tour. Uh, It starts at uh, Boston Garden, uh, wherever that is. Uh, It starts uh, New Year's Eve, and then they travel the world, uh, which they claimed will be their last tour And here's why, get this, it's because they're now all in their 70s. And that's why you're not touring anymore? (laughs) What? Excuse me? Uh, Why not? Why why is being in your 70s, like, not tourable? I I don't understand that. You could limit your tours to maybe five or six cities, but why would you stop touring? What you do is you play music. I don't see any of you with any kind of like limping on stage or using a walker. So what's your problem? Play music. Make money. Do what you do. Why is this your final, your last tour? Give me a break. Also, I don't believe you. Many, many uh, aged rock groups claim that this is their last concert tour. And two years later, it's their, their another last concert tour. And then... Another last concert tour. It's our final tour, I swear. And then two years later, and here we are again. Uh, and I think that's what's, uh, what's going to happen with Aerosmith. I really do. I don't see the problem there. There are certain people who should not be touring anymore. And I hate to say this because I think he's the most incredible talent on the planet, and that's Paul McCartney, uh, an incredible songwriter, arranger, musician, etc. His band that he's put together here is extremely tight and wonderful. Problem, Paul? You can't sing anymore. Your voice is not good. I mean, see, the the songs are so exhilarating and amazing to hear live by the actual person that we override the fact that he just can't sing anymore. His, His voice is just not good anymore. But he keeps touring, and he's well over 70. So what's your problem, Aerosmith? Cher, she stopped touring like 10 years ago. It's my final concert tour. That's my impression of Cher. 
Uh, and she's toured like two or three times since. <laughs> I don't. So stop with this final tour stuff. No one buys it anymore. I think Elton John is on his final tour. Uh, I, I suppose it's the final one because I think the one before it was the final one. Motley Crue, they said in 2000, they did a world tour in 2000. This is our final tour. We're not, we're not playing anymore. 2002, they're playing again and they're doing another concert tour. I mean, come on. The Kiss, ki the Kiss. Kiss uh, has had a few final concert tours. They're still touring. <laughs> the Who, they, they quit back before the turn of the century. And now they're out doing gigs again. Come on. Come on. Stop it. You're bothering me. You're bothering me. Uh, all right. So stop with the final tour stuff. I can't stand you. Um, <laughs> what, what is that? Oh, okay. So how are you? Good to be with you. Uh, you know, I, uh, I don't date anymore. Uh, my wife won't let me. So, uh, but I do have memories. And I do have certain tips for the younger generation that is doing the dating thing. And I, the only thing I can tell you is what I used to do when I was a young, a thriving bachelor. I thrived a lot. I was thriving. I was an expert thriver. And I, uh, I lived in New York City, Manhattan. What it did was uh, I used to go out on a lot of dates because they were fun and I was young. And I knew in the back of my mind from what I was witnessing with my older friends and other couples that you're, you're probably going to get married someday soon. And then you're going to regret that you didn't date a lot. And... I knew that. So I dated a lot. Um, a, a lot. I, I don't know if you can tell by looking at me. I didn't look like this when I was younger. I dated a lot. And what I did was, because I didn't have much money when I was uh, starting out in, in my professional life, didn't have much money, but I did like to date. And that meant a problem. I was living in a studio apartment. Not this kind of studio. This is a cable studio. This is different. A studio apartment, for those that may not be familiar, is a one-room abode. Um, there are, there's, there's a, <laughs> a tour of my living space uh, took no more than 30 seconds and you didn't have to walk around. You could stand in one space and see everything. Uh, yeah, let me give you a tour of my apartment. There's the kitchen. That's my bed. Here's a couch. Did you enjoy the tour? That's it. That was it. That was it. There was one separate room, and it was the bathroom. And in the bathroom, there was a tub, a shower head coming out of the wall, and a pedestal sink, and a toilet. And that was it. And that was my apartment, which I paid a good amount of money for, even though you've just heard the tour. <laughs> so, and that was my final tour. So anyway, so I'm in the studio apartment. So I didn't have a lot of money. But I love to date. And, uh, you know, uh, here, here's what happened. Uh, I, <laughs> there was a store in Manhattan called Bloomingdale's. I don't know if they're still in business or not. I don't think they are, but I'm not sure because I don't keep up on that stuff. Bloomingdale's was a huge apartment store like a Macy's. And then there was a Gimbel's. But now I'm really going back in time. Most of you don't even know what I'm talking about. So I go into Bloomingdale's, it's a huge department store, and as soon as you walk in this particular side of the big department store, uh, it, it, you come up on the cosmetic department. And the cosmetic department was like really freaky. There were five very attractive women uh, dressed 
in white lab coats for no reason whatsoever. It was like when you saw these attractive women in lab coats, you thought you were walking into some kind of the beginning of some strange science fiction porno movie. It's very, very odd. And the women in these white lab coats had tons of makeup on their face as if they had just come out of the big top circus tent. Rouge and lips and eyelashes that would precede you by at least 10 feet when you walked in a room. And mascara by the bucket load. These women, uh, they were attractive, but highly painted. So, um, <laughs> I was not attracted to them. I found them to be circus sideshow-ish, but they had lovely figures, and I knew they were attractive without all that crap on their face, but that's what Bloomingdale's wanted. They wanted to show you just how hideous you can look if you wear their product all at once. Um, I don't know why they wore lab coats. I guess they were some type of cosmetic uh, technicians. I don't know what that means either, but that's what they did. And they also, as you walk through this cosmetic counter area, which was had beautiful glass counters and it was plush rugs. I mean, it was really something they and they played like seductive music i mean they were they were marketing this department like you wouldn't believe they also had perfumes and colognes and as you walk through the department these lovely clown ladies would uh, spray you and they would say give me your wrist young man and that was me and I gave them my wrist, and they would uh, put a little spray, a little dab of spray on it, and then I would smell it. And for men, it's cologne. For women, it's perfume. Same stuff, different label. And mm, 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 that smells nice. And then I would go out on the date, you see. And my date would always say, oh, that really smells nice. That colo what, what cologne is that? Uh, the third lady. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the third lady. I mean, I don't know. Uh, but I smelled good and had some very successful dates because I walked through Bloomingdale's first. <laughs> there was another method, which was even cheaper uh, as far as attitude is concerned, to get to smell good without buying perfume or cologne. And that is the fact that I, I had about three or four magazine uh, subscriptions. And in those days, I don't know if they still do this, but in those days, in the center of the magazine, there'd be a, a card um, adhering to the center binder inside. And it was a, a, a scratch and sniff card. And they have snaff, snaff and fatch. Snatch, snatch and sniff. Did I say that by mistake? <laughs> Is that a little Freudian or what? <laughs> scratch and sniff, I meant to say. Uh, and you'd scratch it and then you'd sniff it. So I would scratch the card and it would be this lovely uh, odor. And if I liked it, it would be lovely. And then I took the card and I, <laughs> I rubbed it on my, my wrist and on my neck. And that was my cologne for about, it worked for about two, three hours. Then I'd rush out the door and go out on the date. And the dates would say, Ryan, you smell lovely. Is that, uh, what is the name of that uh, cologne? Is it third uh, woman in the, uh, in, on the right? No, no. This particular cologne is um, what we call Middle O Magazine. Middle O Magazine. Anyway, uh, those, that's some of my dating tips. Uh, that's, where, uh, that's where I got ready for dates, was walking through a department store or rubbing a magazine on my body. I, it's, I know, you know, it's strange. Men have something also called aftershave. To this day, I don't know what that is. Um, I assume by the title of the product that you put it on after you shave. See, I have, no, I have no need for that. I do shave here, but I don't shave here. 
So I save a lot on aftershave. I don't know the difference between aftershave and cologne, to be honest with you. Uh, I think if you put cologne on your face after you shaved the area, it would burn the hell out of your skin. I guess aftershave doesn't. That's my guess. I don't know. I didn't do any research. I didn't Google that. I, I assume. I, I, I really don't know. I, I don't know much about it. Yeah, but that's some of the stuff that uh, we used to use to get ready. They also call, uh, something comes in a bottle, and it, I think it's French, and it's called Eau de Toilette. And I think that's like a very mild type of perfume. Ladies, is that what that, ladies? There's no ladies here. Is that what that is, Eau de Toilette? Have you heard about that? It's toilet water, but not, not... It, <laughs> apparently uh it's a thing it's a and it's it's been around for centuries and it's uh they call it eau de toilette and you put it on your skin and and you smell good and uh but i think that's toilet water i i i i don't know what that is it's a bad marketing name for this stuff that they sell like for thirty dollars a bottle and Anything you're going to sell that you put on yourself and you're supposed to smell good, the word toilet should be nowhere near that. Just saying. I'm just saying. I have no idea how long the show is today because I forgot to time it. So, uh, I don't know where we are. Um, But I'll continue with the show anyway. Woo. Uh... I apologize for that. I interviewed uh, on on my regular uh, weekday show. I do um, interviews, and I was interviewing a guy who wrote a book, which is what I do a lot of. Uh, interviewing people that wrote books. I don't interview them because of what it says in the book. I interview them because they basically had no life while they were writing the book. And I find that fascinating. I like to speak to people that are different. And writing a book, you're a different kind of person. Some of the books suck. They actually, some of them are have ghost writers, I guess, which is spiritually uh, weird. They don't actually write the book. A ghost comes in and writes it for them. Ooh, that sounds odd. They're headless and everything. Ghost writer is uh, someone who knows how to write an author of a book is someone who doesn't know how to write, has to hire a ghostwriter. They call the ghostwriter because their name is like maybe in the book somewhere like shoved in the middle so you can't see it. And they, they pay the person to write the book. Well, did you write the book? Oh, yes, I did. No, a ghostwriter wrote the book. Not in every case. But anyway, so I do interviews with, uh, with authors. And this particular gentleman, uh, he started a, a website called Other Web. I think it's .com. Uh, I'm not promoting it. I'm just telling you. And uh, he did this book about uh, how n- news overdrive is what I call it, where we are so bombarded by news that we are now walking around literally depressed. And you don't know it, but you are depressed. If you're the kind of person that watches CNN, MSNBC, God, I don't know why you would watch Fox News, but if if that's the case, you are bombarded by news. Uh, and it, And it's an awful thing because they are not news shows really. They tell you something that's happening in the news and they then they discuss it and analyze it for 17 hours. No matter what the topic is, they bring in experts. They bust them in from other countries. They're doing satellite things from the North Pole. They've got they've got a, a, a screen. It's like a Zoom screen with like ten experts on it, uh, uh, f, f, oh, because a, a kid lost his uh, lost his lunch at the grammar school. I, I it's a it's amazing. Most of the news that's being reported and then analyzed for the next seventeen hours is depressingly horrible news. Horrible news, mass shootings war, um, political idiocy. I mean, things that are just like incredibly depressing. 
when you're bombarded by negativity on a regular basis, it does nothing but cause angst and anxiety. And it's up to us to say, look, I know that there are horrible things that go on around us all the time. But I, as a human being, cannot endure the knowledge of all of them. And then to be picked apart and analyzed is too much. I blame two things on the psychological destruction of America and perhaps the world. Two things. One, quite obviously, would be social media. Thank you, but no thank you. You have destroyed our ability to be individuals. Now we all feel like we have to belong to a group or some kind of subgroup. I have to find people to validate what I'm thinking, otherwise what I'm thinking is no good. That's a new thing. That's a bad thing. It used to be in order, in order to, to feel like you were being bullied or torn apart, you had to go to the schoolyard during lunch period or maybe a little bit in the gym locker room. That's where you'd be bullied and knocked down to size psychologically. Now, social media will take care of that anytime you want to have your reputation torn apart, people talking about you, maligning you, throwing you death threats. Welcome aboard, social media. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I can take away the good stuff you do for social media, and I'd be fine. I existed fine without you before. I'm worse off with you now. Number two, because I said there were two things. I can't just do one. Number two, oh my God, cable news networks. I'm not talking about CNN per se. I'm talking about Fox, MSNBC. Newsday, whatever you want. Any show that discusses the news 24 hours a day must be stopped. Well, Ron, you don't have to watch these channels 24 hours a day. No, and I don't eat, have to eat ice cream or sugar or drink alcohol. But because of those things, I eat sugar I eat fat and I need alcohol. Come on, man. That's not news. That's not news. You know that these networks need to fill 24 hours a day every minute. Or at least 20 hours a day. Yet they're entertainment. They're discussion. They are not news at that point. Real news seems to be local news. There are some exceptions, but basically, your news in half an hour with a feel-good story at the end, something about your community where you you live, that would give you a connection and a, and, and a result of, of attention. But I can't be concerned about a couple of people in, in, uh, in the Sudan. I mean, I'm sorry, but I didn't do this. Uh, it's driving us all nuts. And it's up to you to set your own limits. Don't watch the news late at night. Don't watch the news after dinner. Don't, don't, don't put yourself out into situations that can bother you or destroy you. And you may say, hey, the news doesn't affect me. It does. You don't even know it. Take a short uh, commercial break, and when we come back, we'll wrap up the program, because this can't go on forever. Give the gift that says, I love you. The gift that says, happy birthday. The gift that says, get well soon. The gift that says, you're the reason I went into the priesthood. The gift that says, congratulations on not getting indicted. The gift that says, I want to cover you in warm chocolate pudding. 
The gift that says, good luck in clown college. The gift that says, thanks for removing my unsightly wart. The gift that says, sorry about giving you food poisoning. The gift that says, I'll see you in hell. The gift that says, remember the good times we had in prison. The gift that says, I want to make sweet love to you on the white sand beaches of Rio while your hot cousin watches. The gift that says, thank you for the kidney. The gift that says, you deserve all the best, but this will have to do. The gift that says, thanks, Jesus. Whatever you want to say, you can say it beautifully with a timeless gift from Phyllis Gorman's House of Macaroni Art on Route 94 just past the Rotary, across from Sweaty Palmer's Adult Emporium. Well, there you go. I am uh, starting a new program. I find a need for this. It came to me in the middle of the night like a revelation. I am going to start a show that is called, and don't take offense to this because it really makes sense, the 3 o'clock a.m. P. show. Now, you're saying, what? That's right. The 3 o'clock a.m. P. show. And that is because most people after the age of 50, especially men, have to get up in the middle of the night to pee. And it's typically 3 o'clock a.m. You're saying, Ron, that's ridiculous. No, it's not. If you did a poll, and I know you won't, how many people get up in the middle of the night on almost a regular basis to pee? Come on. Come on, raise your hand. Come on. Be honest. And I used to think it was just men that did this over a certain age. And then I started quizzing women about it, which made it a little uncomfortable. But I asked someone, I said, do you pee in the middle of the night? These are people that I know fairly well. Otherwise, I don't tap strangers on the shoulder at the mall. Say, Excuse me, do you get up in the middle of the night to pee? That would be a problem. But with uh, what short research polling I did, I found that women also get up in the middle of the night to pee. And that's a problem because sometimes it's hard to get back to sleep. But we feel better as Americans, as a society, that if other people have the same problems or concerns that we do, then we feel more comfortable about it at least. You're supposed to get eight hours of sleep. Is it supposed to be in a row? Probably. But that three o'clock pee thing is a problem. So I thought, hey, for those that can't get right back to sleep, there should be some place to go, uh, an immediate instant club that they can tap on the shoulder and say, I just got up to pee. I'm back in bed. Someone help me. Where are my peeps? Where are my peeps? Well, I have your peeps. So, uh, I don't know how often I'm going to do it, but I'm going to produce the 3 o'clock P show. It's only going to be three to seven minutes long because I do another show and that's really enough. But I thought this concept was really well needed uh, and odd enough and strange enough that it could take off. So, I ask you, do you get up in the middle of the night to pee? Is it usually 3 o'clock? If you do, Google... The 3 o'clock AMP show, and we'll see what happens. All right. I don't know if I'm out of time. Again, I did not um, set the clock on this one. They do have a clock up here, but it's not a uh, countdown clock, so I don't know how long the show's been going on. Chances are it's running a little short, and after this you'll be seeing a whole lot of bulletin board announcements. (laughs) (laughs) to fill time or they would have pulled me off the air already because I extended myself through the allotted half hour I don't know which it is but something's happening but I don't know what because it didn't time the show hey my fault my bad what are you going to do 
What's the big deal? All right. Uh, try to get a good night's sleep. Thanks for being here. And uh, as always, uh, by the way, uh, you can hear my daily show uh, on ronvandam.com, newenglandbroadcasting.com, or just Google my name, Ron Van Dam, or Ron Van Dam Show. We're on every platform that they ever built. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you peace. Peace. <laughs>